there was a, a, an interesting and difficult question asked in the in the in the break, which I'm proposing to just tackle briefly before we start. Um, there, there, there is a requirement of the fund that that, that, that uh, research is is embedded and in, it's heavily involved in the in the proposition and in the successful propositions. Uh, the question that was asked was, um, given that the researchers and the workshop for the successful propositions ap uh, happens after the decision on whether the proposition is going to get funded, um, isn't there a bit of a catch-22 there? Um, um, I don't think it's that, um, but the, 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 the answer, I think, that I'm being um, given is that um, applicants don't need to know precisely how you're going to do the research. You don't need to know a methodology for the research. You don't need to know who it's going to be because that's a, a part of the matchmaking process. But you need to know that it's a researchable topic. You need to be able to um, be confident that you can argue that it's something that you can actually address with research um, in some shape or form. That's a catch-22 of a slightly different nature. Uh, I accept that. But it, is, it, it does mean you don't have to come in like a PhD method, uh, um, um, proposal with your methodology written down, your process written down. It's not that. Um, but it does have to be um, sort of answer. It does have to be addressable by uh, some kind of research methodology. And if you want to know more about that, John's still around um, and is more than happy to to discuss. I think it's fair. Also, I'll say this without being officially part of the fund. To some degree, this is experimental territory <coughs> for everybody concerned, and trying to work out how to make these things work effectively for all these different kinds of partners um, involves a, involves dialogue and a bit of give and take. Um, from everybody to just try and understand how it's going to work. Clearly, once you get into funding criteria, it won't be dialogue and give and take, but at this point, part of the purpose of these events, to some degree, is to surface some of those questions. Um, so um, the next session, we're going to run maybe till 1 o'clock, depends on how excited we get, and then we'll get back on, on schedule after lunch. Um, I'm going to just give a kind of brief grounding, then we're going to have um, my, two, um, my two colleagues here, um, James and Adrian, who've got experience um, of... Um, of um, innovative arts, digital sort of propositions, talk about what they've been doing, and then bring them back onto um, a little panel together um, for, for a discussion um, uh, of, of the, the things they learned, the things that were successful. I am probably going to ask them the things they learned from the things that weren't successful. Um, somebody with 10 or 15 years experience in this area, I learn much more from the things I get wrong. I'm sure you do too. Um, but as a sort of brief overview, I've been a bit involved in, in some of the thinking about the themes and the workshops and those sorts of things. Um, um, the six themes are, are in front of you, you have, um, the, and we have workshops happening on them this afternoon. Um, to sort of give a bit of perspective on some of the discussions that have been going on, um, and this is not meant to be a definitive answer to you know, why these themes, um, I think it was felt important that they were not art form orientated, so we weren't saying let's do dance digitally, let's do theatre digitally, we didn't get into that trap, partly because um, a lot of the work is going to be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, those ideas, partly because the boundaries between art forms in general are, are, are not are pretty permeable in, in digital, um, partly because there are other funds that do that, um, and things like NPO funding, um, I chair Lighthouse in Brighton, it's a digital NPO, um, part of the proposition of, the, of, of some of that funding is often to specific art form development. At the same time, um, we didn't want to get all into the technology in too much detail. We didn't want to say, and then there'll be apps, and there'll be things that you do on Twitter, and there'll be something you definitely do um, you know, for the Nintendo DS. That, it's not that either. It's the social context of technological change and artistic response to technological change that's been coming up. So there were lots of discussions, and they, they come out in the themes around you know, the impact of, as Andrew Nairn said, this kind of explosion of choice and that's the, the kind of falling down of walls and boundaries, um, different media sort of joining up together is it a film, is it a DVD, is it a live performance, is it a stream, um, and, and, and the way these, the, these kind of boundaries are, are falling down. So choice was a, the explosion of choice was a pretty big part of it. Um, the change in nature of the contexts in which digital um, behaviours happen, alongside live, completely not alongside live, whilst mobile, whilst sitting with another screen on your lap or watching a big screen in a room, in a cinema. So the notion of contextual change and the way that, for instance, mobile technology changes that, but equally the way that learning is not rooted to a classroom, um, et cetera. And that was a, a, a big piece of it. Um, the use of tools and technologies for communication, um, both 
um, expanded one-way communication, if you like, bigger distribution, um, um, new digital marketing techniques that, t techniques that will come up in resources, say, or in the distribution area, but also, crucially, two-way communication from institutions and arts organisations to the people uh, formerly known as the audience, and then, really, rather most interestingly of all, communication amongst everybody out there, social network communication. So this thing about communication was a big clearly a big part of it and that runs I mean obviously runs through most of what we're talking about um, then there was um, a, a strand that was kind of uh, running around um, control how increasingly the capacity to control the experience to tailor your experience to literally be um, if you're playing a game the whole point is control of the experience and what the dimensions of change were and what was interesting about about um, the relationship between arts and technology as people took more and more control and as art forms and media develop that are all about control. And then the final piece was that community comes out of um, all of the above. That you're, Increasingly, it's not a one-way audience relationship and some, to some degree it never was. Certainly, in my view, it never really was. Um, but increasingly, it's about understanding that these communities are very complex. Um, um, they're... Um, full of people who are having personalised media experiences um, and are brought together into shifting sort of communities of interest. Um, that's, that was never written down. I, I, I've written down as, as five words beginning with C, the explosion of choice, the increase, what was the second one, the change in the nature of the context in which media is um, con, con, um, consumed and created and art is consumed and created, um, the use of technology for communication, the uh, increase in control and the fact that communities come out of the back of it. That's not the official line. That was just my sort of reading of, 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 of a lot of the conversation. There were other things too, but you know, forgive me a personal sort of interpretation of it. And then we, uh, I think um, the, the Google process and the workshops and the 60 interviews drew those out into slightly less abstract notions. Um, User-generated content, social media, distribution, education and learning, on which we spend billions as a, as a nation anyway, I accept that's a big territory. Mobile location and games, that's a slightly uncomfortable joining up into a theme because games aren't all mobile and not all mobile locations, obviously games, um, but they're tricky um, um, territories. You can, of course, cross themes. You don't have to say, this is only about distribution. could absolutely be about distribution in a mobile context. And by the way, they play a game to get points to win more distribution capability, whatever you like. Uh, data and archives. And then this, the, the, the category of using digital technology to enable your institution to be more resilient, which will feed back into your artistic um, program or make you money of your tech company. So that's how they, that's a, a sort of story of how, how it came about. Um, and who I've got with me on the, on the, on the panel, um, Adrian Cooper, and they, we put your name on, didn't we, James? James <laughs> Harriman Smith, he got an extra <laughs> consonant. So we probably ran out of Scrabble tiles or something while we were at it. Um, uh, are going to do uh, each going to do a ten or fifteen probably minute um, um, presentation about what they've been up to. I'm going to come back and talk about it. I'm not going to introduce you any more than that because I think you're going to do it yourself, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so Adrian is going to go first. Uh, morning, everyone. I'll just stand up and get nearer to the slides. Yeah, so um, I'm Adrian Cooper, Director of Intelligent Heritage, and I'm going to be talking to you today about this uh, new, recently launched collaborative initi initiative uh, called Your Paintings, which is a, uh, uh, the main two partners in this are the Public Catalogue Foundation and the, the BBC. And as I hope to show, there are many other people um, involved in this, um, this project. So it's great, given that it launched uh, just over a week ago, to have the opportunity to talk about it um, today. Um, so this, this is me. Uh, I think there's some, something about me in the pack. I, uh, Intelligent Heritage, it's a, a, a consulting uh, organization um, specializing in, in arts and culture. Uh, I've been doing this since 2003. And um, so I, I, I work with lots of museums, galleries, archives, uh, arts-based organizations, theaters, festivals uh, in this country and, and, and around Europe, um, doing some really interesting projects. And, and over the last few years, I've been involved with the, the Public Catalog Foundation and became the project manager. I was initially a consultant on this project. And then when it really started to go, uh, um, I, I was the sort of overall person managing your paintings and your paintings tagger, which is as a, uh, an engagement uh, project associated with the main, main project. And my sort of credentials for that were that I've, I've a lot, long experience um, in, this, in this space. Um, I was uh, originally head of, head of ITIS 
at the Royal Opera House from 1988. Uh, I then went to the, to the V&A uh, during a rather interesting time of change uh, in their sort of first person in, 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 in IT across the museum there and looking at uh, that. So, and then I, I went to work for New York-based Gallery Systems, who are a, a museum uh, management software company, and their, their software is used by major museums and small uh, across the world. Um, so all, all, the, all the sort of big, big museums in the state probably use their, use their software. Tate National Gallery and others use that here. And then I left there to set up my own thing. So I'm talking about data and archives. And I was asked to talk a bit about, about that theme. And I think um, we're probably all very much aware that there's a lot of content. There's a lot of, lot of collections and archives um, across, across the country. Some of those are digitized. Many of those aren't. And, and indeed, there's been higher education funding and uh, um, MLA type funding over the last 10 or 15 years where lots of material uh, was digitized. People were applying for funds and, and various things went over. There seems to be, of course, a shift in, in that uh, in the direction you know, people aren't funding digitization anymore, really, uh, with some exceptions. And, and, and now the, the, the sort of movement is on to what can you do with that, uh, with that material. Um, but I think what, what I'm going to show is that this, this project, your paintings, uh, really highlights uh, some of the uh, challenges and opportunities um, in terms of technology and, and uh, audience um, engagement. Um, with that, so just very, very quickly, I think we're all probably very, very highly aware of the of the opportunities. There's there's lots of digitised material. It has all sorts of forms and formats, but there's also lots of material that isn't uh, digitised. Um, in in the context here, of course, we have a high availability and and a take up of broadband services. We we're all consuming this technology on many different devices. So uh, so it you know context as as uh, as was said is 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 huge. We're all using technology everywhere as is evident in this room right now. But there are also open source technologies. The, the barriers to entry in some of this stuff are so much lower. It's very easier for smaller organizations to, to get involved uh, by, by taking you know, uh, third party services, often free, uh, um, storage facilities, cloud-based computing. All of those things um, allow us many opportunities to do something with, with this material that exists. But of course, the challenges are, well, okay, well, apart from, well, what do I do, it, do with it? Who is it for? I think my perspective on all of this is that the, the big question, which I think has been raised a couple of times this morning, well, you know, who is it? Who is the audience? What am I doing it for? What's the purpose of this? Um, is often not asked uh, and not asked enough. Many, many of, of these projects are led either from a technology perspective, and indeed in, in some cases they're about infrastructure. And so if we, if we want to think of what's been happening over the last years, there's a lot of, you know, you've got to have the material in a format to then exploit it. So you need to have that, those enabling works. But, but uh, some of the, the challenges around that, of course, are the cost of actually uh, digitizing uh, the, the material themselves, as you'll see with this, this particular project, uh, technology choices, the copyright of, of lots of material, the huge challenges with that. Uh, different material from different organizations have different standards, structures, formats. So making those shareable, linkable, is a huge challenge in itself. I've talked about the audience. But even if you build something, the, the big issue is will actually people look at it and engage with it? And that's, that's, the, huge, that's the biggest challenge of them all. If you build it, will they come? So that promotion and awareness to actually drive traffic to your thing is, is hugely, uh, hugely important. So I'm actually going to try now to, to introduce the Your Paintings project with a short video. This was made by the BBC, and I think it says so much more than I can possibly say um, in, in, in this short time. So um, I will now go to this and hope that the technology is working. We have in this country probably one of the biggest collections of art in the world. Over the past uh, five or six years, we've been cataloguing paintings in national ownership, so anything from museums, schools, libraries, hospitals, fire stations, councils, um, right down to village halls. Yes, at the east end of our offices, uh, we have the large Hogarth triptych. It is beautifully painted. It's staggeringly well done. It's on a massive scale. It's like nothing else he did before. And that is what is important. When the air raids began in 1940, there were not enough fire engines available. And of course, one of the biggest fleets available, particularly in London, was that of taxis. It's almost live reporting. It's painted right at the start of the Blitz and someone from the fire service had the, the idea 
to grab the canvas that they could from the roof of the towing taxi. It's very unusual to find something painted by a member of the fire service um, of colleagues in action. A lot of these paintings, uh, they might not be, uh, shall we say, highly professional, but a lot of these paintings meant a lot to people at the time. There's a, a story behind that, and it's that story that should be, should be remembered. Well, during the Second World War, there was a secret air base at Harrington. An American airman painted the mural. At the end of the war, they presented it to the villagers of Clipston, and the wall in school is the only wall in the village that's large enough to, to house a painting. It was given to the village of Clipston as a gift of friendship, so the people of the village would not forget us. When the museum closed down in the mid-70s, everything was taken down and moved down into the nuclear bunker. And that's where they've been all this time. This is a really exciting opportunity now for us because having catalogued all the paintings, it gives us the opportunity to share these paintings with everybody. There's a very strange octagonal painting above a doorway and we, we discovered that actually there's another half to the painting. But the fun bit is when um, we try and stick him together, there he goes. We've got our man. I mean the wonderful thing about them all going online is that there will be everything from portraits, to landscapes, pictures telling stories. Uh, and it'll be the most fantastic resource for people coming to it from all angles. So there, there we go. Um, I think as they say at the end there, pictures telling stories, I think that says, that says it all. So, so your paintings, what is it? It's, it's a website. Um, it's, uh, it's really the, the website is the start of, uh, of, this, of this engagement. Uh, it's hosted and, and uh, led editorially by the BBC. It's an, and, it's, and for them, this is a, the first of what they're calling a public space uh, partnership project. So they're, they're looking to, to, uh, to do things with, uh, with public content and, and, and focus their own remit as a broadcaster in um, what they can do around publicly available um, material. Um, and um, so, of course, the, there are a lot of people involved in this. I'm going to show you some slides of the, of the, the, the website in a moment. But just to say very quickly, the, the website itself has four key objectives, which is about improving access to that material, enhancing learning, engaging a wider audience and promoting the collections themselves. So very much as well as looking at paintings online, one of the purposes of this is to actually drive people to actually go and see these paintings themselves. So it's not aimed at an academic, art historical type of audience. It's aimed at trying to engage the public in art. Um, and, and, and it's using the, the nation's collection of all paintings um, to, do, to do that. So. Um, it's in, in, so who is involved? Clearly, I've mentioned the BBC. Uh, their role is to is to to, to host and, and 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 provide all of the editorial related stuff. They designed the site in, in collaboration. The Public Catalogue Foundation was really the start of this project because the Public Catalogue Foundation was set up about eight or nine years ago with a sole remit to catalogue all the all the paintings in the national collection. And originally, the brief was to put those out as catalogues. A few years ago, it was very clear that having this online would be would be with a purpose. So, so the Public Catalog Foundation and its, and, its, and its team have been working across the country digitizing and cataloging all of this work in, in partnership with 3,000 um, museums. Um, so, but we've, we've had other partners involved in that. The University of Glasgow is involved as a, as a, as a, in an art historical context to make sure that certain aspects of this are, are there. As, as you may see on the site, um, there are various navigational routes which are important to get right. Uh, they've been involved in those. We worked on the TAGA project uh, of, uh, with the University of Oxford, the astrophysics department, I'll explain it shortly. Of course, we have 3,000 museums, galleries, police stations, fire stations, universities, the National Trust, you know, you name it. There, there are paintings in national ownership in many, many places across, across the country. And of course, the other partner in all this, we hope, is the public. 
um, at large and, and engaging these people um, with that. So just a sort of brief look at the website. There's, a, there's, the, there's the home page. Um, I hope those of you who haven't seen it already will look at it. Uh, the home page at the moment is trying to point people to the various different things that you can do. And right in the middle there is help, help us tag the nation's paintings, which is the tagging project, which I'll come to. Uh, as you'll see, there are 63,000 of the, of the uh, targeted 200,000 paintings online. And you can do things like search for, for artists, for paintings, for galleries. So all of this is up there live, and it, went, it went, uh, went live last week. But very much this is the start of the process. Getting that material digitized and being able to put it online, we very much now want feedback from the, from the public to say, OK, so what should we be doing next? Clearly, we have ideas about what we're doing, but, it's, but it now is the time to engage people um, in that. So I'll quickly just go through these slides here so you can see that there, there, there's a um, uh, you know, vast range of, of, of pictures here, and there are many different routes uh, to find this. So I won't, I won't dwell too much on this because I'm conscious of the of the time. You can also find information through the galleries themselves. Um, now, then, tagger. So one of the issues, of course, around gathering all of this material is that we we had to get a certain amount of, of information from the museums themselves. But we need for the site to properly engage. You need keywords, tags faceted browsing, all of these ways in which you can provide routes to this information for people. Uh, so we thought long and hard about this in many different ways. Uh, could, we could, of course, pay for catalogues to, to do that or ask the, the museums to provide different things. But of course, that needed to be harmonized across this entire set. Each different museum probably does things in different ways. They have different terminology, et cetera, et cetera. But we needed something that would work across this entire, uh, entire site. So we started to look at projects that, that involve tagging, user-based tagging, where, where people put the, put the stuff. But we combined that with the idea of, of uh, a notion of, of what's called crowdsourcing, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. We came across um, this uh, project called Galaxy Zoo, which was done uh, at the astrophysics department at uh, Oxford University, where they had this challenge to, to basically categorize millions of, of, uh, of records of galaxies. And they set up this uh, Citizen Science Alliance initiative. They developed some very, very smart software which allowed the collective intelligence of lots of people looking at these things to come up with an answer. And they proved to themselves through this work that the answers they got from the collective intelligence of lots of people was actually as good as any academic uh, work on this. But of course, they could do the work in so much less time. So we took that approach in terms of developing the tagger where we wanted to be able to say, let, let's, let's allow the public to look at paintings, tell them, uh, tell us what they think they can see in that. There is some structure to it. There's a flow that you have to go through, but it's quite intuitive. Um, and, but so rather than a simple tagging process where you just put in a key word and it has probably no context, this, because it's connected, interconnected to open data like Wikipedia and the Oxford English Dictionary, et cetera, et cetera, allows us to have some knowledge behind what those tags actually do mean. So so we worked uh, very collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with uh, a number of people, uh, technology partners and uh, usability people, to come up with a workflow. Uh, paintings are delivered at random to people. You can't choose the painting that you're going to tag, because we, we thought that if we just allowed that, then some paintings would get lots of tags, the popular ones, and others would never get touched at all. We needed all paintings to be tagged. So you can skip a painting, but you're presented with a painting, and then you have the opportunity to go through a, a flow. What things do you see? What people do you see? What places? What events? And then there are a couple of sort of semi-structured things, types and subjects, uh, and then uh, if you, depending on what level of user you are, you are, if you're a sort of more expert user, you are, you're allowed to have a go at saying what date you think this paint was painted, or what style this particular painting is in. So if you haven't tagged already, then I encourage you to do so. Uh, there's lots of people out there tagging, and, and uh, we're all told it's becoming terribly infectious. So this is real engagement. So it's letting people see paintings. You don't know what's coming next. You're, you're, of course, there's a huge variety variety uh, that you see, uh, and um, there you can see as you type the, the list of, of words from, from, uh, uh, from Wikipedia via, via Google API appear to you, and then in some cases you get to search from a list, so there's some structure uh, to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we've launched that, and people are doing that uh, right, right now. Uh, of course, 
uh, there's, a, there's a very sort of complex and um, very modern infrastructure that supports all of that. PCF themselves have a very, uh, a very comprehensive web-based web uh, database, which we're receiving all the, all the content from the 3,000 um, odd collections. Um, and then in terms of the tagger, we're, we're using a, a cloud-based infrastructure, Amazon Web Services, in order to be able to cope with a potential large demand. So this can grow and, and not, not fall over. Um, so, so setting all that up, providing a mechanism to record, capture, produce results, and send those back to the BBC. Uh, I'm not expecting you to read that, but that's, that's sort of, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, quite a comprehensive workflow and, and a range of, of, of APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, that connect all these things together and feed the data through to the BBC um, as, it, as it goes along. And there's a quick slide of the, of the, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, application that the PCF use. Um, so I think that's really all I wanted to say okay. about this. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm guessing we're going to make the presentations available, are we? Is that how we have yes, with they, that? Yes, they, they are. Yes. Um, so don't feel you have to take all the notes and everything else. Um, 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 I'm going to um, take questions um, when uh, we're, we've finished both case studies. So, um, James, if you'd um, if you'd like to go over, um, but while you're sort of on your way, um, Adrian, there's a kind of combination of curation, openness, expertise, sort of passion in the middle of that project. Do you think those are core? Are they core requirements for a data and archives project? Are they core requirements for interactive digital projects full stop? Um, yes, I mean, I, I mean, I think so. I mean, that, that, that issue of you know, who you're doing it for and, and, and uh, why might people uh, come to it are, are part of that. I mean, there's so much material there, trying to find material that is interesting and engaging for people, and more importantly, allowing them the opportunity to engage with it, it will, will, will only uh, uh, start that process. So the tagging is, is one of the first initiatives of that engagement-like uh, thing where people, they don't realize that they're learning uh, and then being entertained in some cases by, by doing that, by that doing, work. By going yeah, and, and telling other people about it. Yeah, you should do this. It's fun.